This is Lauren. And she Hi. pitched. <laughs> okay, that's the intro. <clears throat> Stevie Wonder, Mariah Carey, Jacob Collier, Mozart, Jimi Hendrix, Thundercat, I think. Charlie Puth, Whitney Houston, Beethoven, Ray Charles, all have or had the biggest musical blessing anyone could ask for, which is the condition of perfect pitch. And here's a C sharp. Here's an F sharp. Oh, A minor diminished. A. If you do music, you know what perfect pitch is, but if you don't, allow me to explain to you not only what it is, but more importantly, how it's perceived by others. In short, perfect pitch or absolute pitch is the ability to hear this note or any note and go, I know what note that is. But the catch is they don't actually see what note anyone's playing. They just hear it and know. The most common analogy is the color analogy, which is essentially, imagine the entire world is colorblind, but people with perfect pitch are actually able to see colors. It's a very rare condition or skill that only around one in 10,000 people have, but the more important thing to talk about is how other musicians as we grow up see them. Like fucking unicorns. I remember reading about them when I was a kid and being like, oh my God, I can't wait to meet one one day. I wonder if I will. And I vividly remember the first time I met someone who had it. I was like 15, he was 12, and I was, my mind was blown. It was the coolest thing I'd ever seen ever. But historically and now, there are some serious drawbacks that come with this ability. The condition of having absolute or perfect pitch is kind of a modern condition. And it's not that ancient people didn't have it, but it was that it was kind of hard to tell if someone had it back then. The first reason is that tuning was not standardized in Europe. So depending on what country you were, what village you were, what event you were at, were you at church or were you at a music event, tuning would be different. An A at church could have been tuned completely different than the A at even another church or the town over. As opposed to now, everything's tuned the same. Mm, la, that's an A in Europe, that's an A in England, that's an A. That's an A in Alabama, that's an A in Japan, that's an A everywhere, and you can test for that. La, if you could hear that that was an A, there's a chance you had a perfect pitch. But if you were in 1600s Germany, la, oh, that was a little sharp, don't roast me. Could be an A, but if you grew up in a different town, you could call that a B. But there is a second really interesting but very nerdy reason why it was hard to tell if someone had perfect pitch back then. And it's gonna be hard to explain because it goes into music physics, but let's try. Okay. In modern times, most places, especially in the West, we use a thing called equal temperament tuning. And in short, without going super nerdy, it basically means that every key you play sounds the same. For example, this is tuned in equal temperament. If I play this riff in B, this is what it sounds like. Let's play it up a half step in C. It sounds higher, but it sounds the same. Like it sounds just like the same thing, but that's not how tuning in Europe used to be. Okay. Sorry, as an audio nerd, I, I just needed a microphone. The room noise is terrible in here. Ugh. And if you're a little bit lost right now, it's not you. This stuff can get a little complicated, but I promise you it's going to make sense. To better understand how they used to tune instruments, let us read some quotes from some famous people. From the famous philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau, he writes, why does a piece played in A major no longer have the same expression that it had in G major. From Leopold Mozart, who is Mozart's father. How is it that a well-practiced musician on hearing a composition can instantly specify the key note? When I first read this, my first thought was, did everyone have perfect pitch back then? The answer is obviously no. The reason why musicians, no matter who you were, could tell what key someone was playing was because they used to tune instruments not to play every key really well, but to play a few keys really well. There's a YouTuber called John uh, Moraitis, and he actually has a great video explaining like Baroque tuning versus modern tuning, but just let's show a section of it so you can see what it sounds like. That was a B major chord. It sounds very pleasant, very nice, very like ordinary, right? But watch when he plays the exact same chord up a half step. 
it's the same chord, but it's just like off. Like there's just so much dissonance and just the wave forms are just kind of like, vuh, vuh, vuh. it just, it doesn't sound good. That's what Rousseau and Mozart were talking about. If you were a good musician at the time, you could tell what key someone was playing, not because everyone had perfect pitch, but it was because each key had its own character. Sharp keys, like let's say F sharp major, were said to be very bright and almost brash on your ears, while flat keys like E flat major were said to be very dark and mellow and kind of calm. Huge caveat, there is a ton of different types of tuning. There's quarter comma mean tone, there's Pythagorean. Music is really old and so is tuning. And so me saying these general rules is like almost disrespectfully simplifying the whole journey of it. Also not gonna bullshit you, I've tried to understand this for the last three days, still don't get it. It's fucking way above my head, nope. But the point I'm trying to make is because they didn't use the same tuning back then, each key sounded different, and that would basically allow average musicians to be able to say, oh, I know what key that is, because they can hear it. What this has to do with perfect pitch is that, functionally, you could argue that a lot of musicians who just had relative pitch had functional perfect pitch, because they could tell what key someone was playing in. Oh my god, hey, is it time for our paid promotion brought to you by my Patreon? I think it is. I currently have 18 members and you guys fucking rock. I, I have no idea how much I love you guys. Like, thank you. Obviously it helps out the channel. It also allows me to do these videos, but I'm also starting to do like some cool videos and content just for Patreon. Like for example, do you want to know how to chemically decarboxylate these at home? I'm gonna show you. Dosing information, nerdy stuff, just general uh, papers that I read, weird obscure articles I found from the 1930s, 1800, whatever. I put it all there. I also really appreciate the community in it. I've been texting a few of you guys on there and you guys give me like the feedback on thumbnails and it's just, I really appreciate it. I would love if you, if you enjoy this shit, come, come pay me money. Was that too honest? I, I feel like socially you're not supposed to say that. Um, join the community or whatever. Back to the video. Also, I wanna start doing some really cool in-depth research. For example, this video, I had the idea of researching absolute pitch and perfect pitch in ancient societies of like China and India, but you have to hire people who can like read those languages and like do that research. So uh, yeah, sorry about this being super, super European, but okay, N now it's back to the video. But even though we didn't have the term perfect pitch or absolute pitch, we still had reports of people having this condition. Sir Gore Asley uh, was said to have remarked at age five, only think, Papa blows his nose on G. <laughs> How we know Mozart had it is because there's a report of him at the age of seven basically playing a violin and noting that it was like an eighth of a tone lower than the one that he's used to at home. But the really funny thing is that since they didn't have a term for it, it was like kind of just, it was a, a rare ability that was still quite like, wow. Um, <laughs> there's people who had it, but had no idea. For example, Johan Matheson, who I'm not gonna read the whole quote, if you want, pause. But basically he goes into why certain keys fundamentally sound different than others, not realizing that like he's the only one hearing it like that. Like everyone else does not hear music like he does, but he's writing like, well, obviously a C feels different than a C sharp. And it's like, bro, not really. <laughs> and the other thing to keep in mind, which is really weird to think about, is that when you had perfect pitch back then, it actually sometimes was a, a pretty big disadvantage when it came to transposition. A report from Percy Scholl says, McDowell, a most able pianist, playing on an occasion a so-called Moonlight Sonata, which every schoolgirl plays, got through it with the greatest difficulty, the piano being at a pitch to which he was not accustomed. He experienced the distress of playing the piece in one key and hearing it in another, which he said nearly knocked me out. And there's other reports of people who had perfect pitch where they're like, okay, I'm used to a certain song sounding in a certain key, but then they go down to sit on the piano and when they go to play a C, it's not a C, it's like a B flat or it's a D or something completely off. And so they're like literally like, like it's like what the heck is going on? They're literally confused because you're playing something but hearing another thing. To demonstrate what this confusion would kind of look like, I have my friend Adrian, who does have perfect pitch, and I kind of fucked with him. We're gonna have to do the, yeah. The good old, you know. Okay. Okay, don't look at the keyboard now. All right, I'll turn around. What note is this? G, B flat, F. Okay. Oh, is that the B string you're tuning? Yep. Oh, it's supposed to be down to B. I know. Okay. Okay. So what I'm gonna do, 
So I'm going to fuck up your bass because everything's going to be tuned up a whole step. Okay. You see, Adrian is used to playing his bass in the same tuning all the time. And so when he plays a note, he hears that note before it's even being played because he has perfect pitch. But since I tuned it all up a whole step, it's almost like he's lost his ability a little bit or he has to literally transpose as he goes, which is like an extra step. Next, I chose a song that he's never heard before that it was pretty harmonically complex and said, play along to it. Okay, right. you see what I'm doing now? Yes, I do. Okay. <laughs> I just realized I can't actually play the song because I'd be copyright striked. So um, I'm just gonna play the chords under it and so you can see how harmonically complex it is. And if you know the song, Put it in the comment section. All of my life, I never know you to fail. Don't roast me, roast Adrian. You remain the same name. Roast Adrian, not me. What is your name? All of my life. So that one, how, how, was that because the bass was off or is that just because it's a fucking complicated ass song? Well, it would be less complicated if my bass was tuned like what I'm used to. And to clarify something, Adrian is not like an average bass player. He's like like next level, very talented. Uh, the, the transposition messed him up for maybe 20 minutes, but after that, he just adjusted, played everything spot on, right? But now you can kind of see that having perfect pitch while super useful sometimes, when it comes to certain things like transposition, it can be a little bit harder for them sometimes just because it's an extra step. While people with me who just have relative pitch, it's not really hard at all. It's just like shifting my hand left to right. I don't really notice too much of a difference. But uh, let's get to where perfect pitch becomes controversial. 1880s, a guy called Carl Stumpf, who's a psychologist, coins the phrase absolute pitch and um, basically pioneers the idea that there's these population of people who have this ability that's different than the rest. This is also where the comparison to color comes in. They called it a pitch color or tone chroma because people who have this ability, similar to the rest of us, can read wavelengths with color, they can read wavelengths with sound. But after Stumpf, there was all these studies about perfect pitch, but the problem with it is that everyone who's conducting these studies didn't have perfect pitch, so like, no one really understood it. But the drama comes in when a guy called A. Beckham, don't even know his full name, I just know his studies, kind of comes up with the idea, he does all these studies, it's really comprehensive, really cool, and he basically says like, yeah, uh, hate to break it to everyone, but you can't learn perfect pitch. It's innate, it, you're born with it. People didn't like that. Uh, uh, a lot of people got bitter. Um, there's definitely reports of some major haters because honestly, they just kind of were bitter that they didn't get it and they wanted it. John Davies writes, in the past, perfect pitches tended to be viewed with a certain degree of reverence. Nowadays, however, there is less interest, and it generally is accepted that a sense of relative pitch is crucial to musical performance, whilst perfect pitch is little more than an unusual curiosity, which confers little or no musical advantage in its possessors. Yeah, that's, that's not true. Perfect pitch is very beneficial in a lot of ways. He's kind of just hating. Another professor, Dixon Ward, who was a major hater, goes, it appears that absolute pitch is typical of either musical precociousness or mental retardation. So if you have it, be sure it is for the right reason. He also like kind of compared people with perfect pitch to like dogs and like animals and were like, yeah, it kind of sucks. Like I would never want it. Like, bro, you are such a hater. <laughs> but the interesting thing about these attitudes is that they actually, a lot of them still persist pretty majorly today. I never wanted it to be something anybody would be like jealous of or anything because like when I was growing up, like it, people were jealous of it and I was like blacklisted basically from like hanging out with people because of it. And I'm like, that's so stupid. Like, And here's another one of my friends who, well, I, I, I knew her one time from band camp, but we still follow each other on Facebook. This is Lauren. And she Hi. is pitched. <laughs> I definitely think that it also comes with its negatives. Um, like what? Um, feeling like like you don't belong or like I didn't ask for this thing I'm doing with my my head or this you know this like thing that I end up like doing with my thoughts. So that's also partly why I don't like to like tell people or I don't really tell people or talk about it um, because the call to prove yourself can be a little overwhelming. What she's talking about with the call to prove yourself is something that. Anyone with perfect pitch knows exactly, uh, which is the test. Some random motherfucker comes up to you when you're in school and goes, hey, what note is this? I don't know, A flat. <laughs> was that an A flat? It was, it was an A flat. Oh shit! Oh. 
The point is, is that, yeah, perfect pitch can be really dope, but there's a lot of aspects that a lot of us don't really think about. Like the fact that some of your friends might treat you a little bit different if they found out, or the fact that some teachers might teach you a little bit different if they found out. There can be a lot of pressure that comes with it. There's some kids who feel like they have an obligation to become a professional musician because they have it. And there's like a lot of people, you know, once you say you have it, everyone's like, oh, you must be amazing at your instrument. It's like, no, there's, there's people who have perfect pitch who kind of suck. <laughs> Did you ever feel pressure throughout your life that like, I need to be a musician because I got like this skill. It would be a waste if I wasn't pro. Yes. Yeah. I would definitely say so. Yeah. Wow. For, for better or worse, there's like a connotation about like perfect pitch that it's like, whoa, you have this talent and whoa. And, and it's just like, whoa, oh my God. Like, what if I don't have that anymore? And that's kind of how it ends. A lot of people who have perfect pitch will lose it. My friend, Josh, when he got sick one time when he was younger, he completely lost it. It was like, he was like, everything was like off a half step for him. It eventually came back, but a lot of the time it won't come back. And you're just kind of regular like the rest of us, which is kind of dark when you think about it. This thing that shaped your personality and shaped how people perceived you is just gone. And you're kind of just, it's like knowing what colors look like and then being colorblind and kind of also wonder if it feels similar to what someone who's like black or a person of color goes through if they have vitiligo and they lose all their pigmentation. Like, I, I've, I have no idea what that would feel like, but I would imagine it's kind of similar. Like your identity was kind of stricken from you, but you still have that to your core. Like, how would that feel? I don't, if you have vitiligo, let me know. That's very interesting. But I did so much research that didn't make it into this video. So for the last part, let's just do a quick round of misconceptions, fun facts. There seems to be a link between autism and perfect pitch. One study suggests 500 times more likely with autistic people than the regular population. 500 times is cr crazy. So I'm not like bitter or nothing like that, but like I was diagnosed with autism and I just find it like, it's kind of bullshit that I didn't get it, you know? That's kind of crazy. Isn't that, that kind of bullshit? Some people have what we call quasi-perfect pitch. There's a couple definitions I found about this, but this one study I have in front of me is it's a guy who literally had one note for perfect pitch. Everything else he had to use relative. So he heard mm, la, which I think is C, okay? La, he knew anytime a C played, that's a C. But if he heard la, he would go mm, the, A flat. He'd do the mental math, right? I think that was an A flat, okay? But he used relative pitch to get A flat. So it wasn't true, absolute pitch, right? So interesting. I do that bit just to show how good my relative pitch was. Maybe. Am I still totally not bitter about not having perfect pitch? No, I'm not bitter. I'm not bitter. I keep telling you guys that, Jesus. Perfect pitch can actually be transposed for some people. For example, Lauren learned piano at a young age with her piano teacher's piano being a half step down. And so when she hears a C, the rest of us, it's actually C sharp. If you speak a tonal language like Vietnamese, you have a much higher chance of developing absolute pitch. 60% of Beijing students who had begun studying music between the ages of four and five passed an absolute pitch test, whereas only 14% of American students did. And for this last one, let's let Lauren take us out. Are you, is it easier to write music if you have perfect pitch? Is it easier to do whatever that's actually functional with perfect pitch from your experience? Yeah, 100%. Um... I think, wow, um, I just realized kind of like a lot of random things, mm -hmm. even like maybe being able to detect, detect like a slightly different sound out of like a car or like a device or like technology and being like, oh, this doesn't sound right. You know what I mean? Like, cause I can just like, I just kind of would immediately notice that and then be like, oh, something's kind of off, you know? That's actually um, happened to you where you're like, that's not, that's not right. I can hear the frequency that's off. Yeah, like my car right now. My car's got something going on. <laughs> That's so cool. My okay. car's got something going on right now. 